why this one, this stress tends to be low in horizontal direction. If you push too much, though, we're going to see that the vertical stress are going to start to be higher, maybe, than the vertical stress. But that's when you push a lot. And sometimes, if you push even more, uh, we're going to see that these stresses may even, could even be higher than that, higher than vertical stress, both of them. But let me ask you a question, and we're going to get to this later on. Do you think this stress could grow forever? as large as possible as you push from the sides. You say no, why, why no? Miss, what's your last name? Yes. Aladdin. Okay, so why, why do you say no? Because the rock is going to fracture. Because the rock is going to fracture, the rock is going to break. So with elasticity, we're not going to be able to predict this maximum because elasticity doesn't consider fracture. But later on, uh, we're going to see that uh, if you push too much, too much, the rock is going to crack, it's going to fall. And this, this wall is not going to grow forever. And actually the same for this. This one cannot go very low because always the, the fault is going to, to fracture. Uh, because if you have a lot of difference in stresses in two directions, vertical and horizontal, the rock is not going to be able to resist that and it's going to fracture. Uh, so, uh, now we're going to uh, go through the theory that's going to let us explain many, many things, but also it's going to allow us to calculate horizontal stresses with a given tectonic strength. And it's going to be able, uh, it's going to allow us to predict uh, horizontal stress with, with the theory. That sometimes could be wrong, sometimes could be right. Uh, most times, what we do with that theory is we calibrate it based on other data uh, to explain uh, the variations of horizontal stress. All right, so I think we can decide for horizontal stress. Okay, good. So we finish horizontal stress here, and let's talk about elasticity. Let's do a very quick review of elasticity. I know that uh, you guys probably remember this from, uh, what, what is the course that you take uh, on uh, mechanics? Um, solids? Okay, in solids, very likely, you saw Cook's law, right? Can anyone tell me what, what Cook's law is? F equal K, and let me call it instead of X, delta X, okay? Where, what is F? F is the force that you use to pull a string, which is attached, let's say, to a wall, and that causes a displacement delta X, and the spring has a constant K. So, uh, the, uh, the more you pull, the higher the force uh, is going to be. That's uh, Hooke's law. Let's take that to now uh, well, one dimension, but in terms of the stresses, not the force. You still want the, uh, you convert this equation instead of force, now we're going to have force divided by area. It's going to be equal to a proportionality constant. That now we're just going to call key, but it's just that a proportionality constant of the delta L divided by L. And that equation is going to apply for a solid. Let's say a, a solid bar which same as the spring is attached to a wall and he has it in area A, he has an original length L and you're pulling here with the force F. Uh, what well is going to be F divided by A? 
it's going to be stressed very well. And we're going to call that sigma. And the proportionality uh, constant is going to be the same. And when it's going to, what's going to be delta L divided by L? That's something that we're going to define as the deformation. So the change of length divided the original length, we're going to call that strain. And we're going to call it epsilon. So if, if this is a stress and has the units of Pascal's or PSI, what are going to be the units of strain? Unitless, right? So no units. So what are going to be the units of this proportionality cost? It's going to be Pascal's too. So uh, very likely you remember that, as I said, from, from your solid graph. Now we're going to take this concept into three dimensions. Because that's what, that's what we need in order to solve problems in the subsurface. So let's go 3D. And it's actually going to be the same example, but we're going to change the method. We're going to have our prismatic bar. Now, standing up vertically, on that prismatic bar, uh, we're going to apply uh, a stress, which are going to be all these lethal forces distributed into this phase. And we're going to call, uh, since, since this is going to be a, a 3D example, <coughs> let me add a, a coordinate system, which is going to be 1, 2, and 3, right hand of the coordinate system, right? Index 1, middle 2, and 3, going down. Uh, if this is the case, what is the name that you think I should put to, for this stress? Yes. Um, I could be tempted to do that, S3. Uh, we're going to see later on that there is a more uh, a more accurate definition for that. And let, just to keep this as called sigma, it's going to be called sigma 3-3. Three, three. Okay? And we're going to see later why this is called sigma 3-3. Three, three. Alright, so if, if I apply a stress sigma 3-3 three, three on the sides, I'm not going to apply any stress, I'm sorry, I apply sigma 3-3 three, three on the top, okay? Here at the bottom, uh, there is going to be the surface that doesn't let the, the, free, the solid move, but let's say it's frictionless. So, this one can move to the sides if needed. The stresses on the sides, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2, are going to be equal to zero. So sigma 1, 1 will be the stress on this side. Sigma 3, 3 is going to be the stress on that side. That example over there is the same as the one I have over here, okay? So I have my prismatic element, so, so this is a piece, piece of rubber, I don't know, probably, probably you can see it better here, the shape is the same as what I draw. And to that, I'm going to apply, let me see if I move it further up, so, Just exactly on top of the camera. Okay, there is the element. I'm going to apply a stress on the top. I'm not, not no stress on the sides. What happens? Uh, try, let me, it's kind of difficult here with the shape. Let me see if I. Zoom out or zoom in? The problem is that I, I get the shadow. Okay, let, this is the okay. Uh Okay. 
So there is an element, okay? But I'm gonna have to come down with this element. I apply stress on the side. And let's say I'm not gonna move it in this direction, I'm just gonna move it in the other one. You see that it's kind of long. I'm gonna give you my toy a bit, okay? But it gets shorter in one direction and it gets wider in the other. So it's gonna be very bad just like this, okay? So you see it gets short in one direction and wider in, in the other. How much stress do you think I'm putting to, to this rubber? How many pounds do you think I can put on to do my feet? 20, 20 pounds, I like that, yeah, 20 pounds. So, so 20 pounds is more or less 10 kilos, okay? We're going to calculate the yam models of this driver because this one, what you're going to do in the lab next week with the rock. Remember lab next week, okay? Monday, Tuesday, uh, whatever time uh, you, uh, you need to be there, uh, just, just mm -hmm. okay? But again, the rubber, uh, I push it in this direction, it's shorter, that one gets wider in the other. So, uh, let's do a schematic of that. And just for simplicity, I'm going to do it in, in 2D. These are my prismatic element. And I deform it by applying a force. It's shorter in one direction, wider in the other. Uh, here I have sigma 3,3. Three. And I this is the original length. Uh, no, that's not the original length. The original length is, goes up to here, L3. And there was a change of length. Delta L3. OK. So um, I'm going to define. Uh, the proportionality constant E and the, the Young modules is by definition is going to be equal to the stress I applied divided the deformation in the direction in which I applied the stress, epsilon 3, 3. Where epsilon 3, 3 in this case is going to be delta L3 times L3. So it is, it's almost exactly the same as before, okay? But, but not quite, because we're going to add uh, something right um, We captured that the solid was getting short in, in this direction, direction 3. But there is one more phenomenon here that the solid is also getting wider in the other direction, right? In order to capture that, uh, we're going to define this variable, Greek letter nu, and it's going to be defined as negative sign times the change in deformation in direction. Uh, let, let me do it in direction 2 here. It's the same as one divided the change in length in direction one. What is epsilon two two? Epsilon two two. If this is L two, and notice that it deforms to the two sides, so each of those is going to be delta L two divided by two. Epsilon two two is delta L two divided L2, and it's going to be the same in direction 1, exactly the same. Notice that the Poisson ratio tells you how much the solid expands to the sides. And this, this is the same with the rocks in the subsurface. As you add more load and load on top, the rocks also try to expand to the sides. How much they expand to the side, it will depend on the Poisson ratio. Yes? Why is the first ratio negative? Because that's a mistake. So it should be also negative. Okay? Thank you for catching that. 
But let's say, what is, why are those negative? Well, Look that if we apply compression on one side, then we have expansion on the other side. Those strains actually are going to have different sizes. Compression is going to be positive. Attention in our convention is going to be negative. So this epsilon 2, 2 uh, is going to be expansion. It's going to be a negative number. It's going to be a positive number, negative and negative. That's going to be positive. And, and that, that's just a our convention, instead of dealing with a quantity which is negative, we prefer to deal with something which is positive. Uh, and that Poisson ratio, typically for solids, is going to go from zero to 0 0.5, or some, something close to that. I'm going to give you a little bit more values for rocks, but well, let me tell you right now. For rocks, it varies, but more or less goes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. But let's try to understand the meaning of this Poisson ratio. If Poisson ratio is equal to 0, it will mean a solid that when you push in one direction, doesn't expand in the other direction. A solid with a positive Poisson ratio it means that when you push in one direction, it does expand in the other direction. However, that Poisson ratio cannot be higher than 0.5. Because that would mean that, if it's higher than 0.5, it would mean that you push it one, and it expands uh, more than one and one in the other directions, which it means that when you compress it, it, it gets a bigger into a bigger volume, which doesn't really make sense. That kind of violates. Uh, uh, some uh, laws. So, it cannot be higher than 0.5. We're going to see later on that for fluids or some type of rocks, it gets very close to 0.5, which is nearly incompressible, but it cannot be higher than 0.5, okay? If you, in the exam, if you put the Poisson ratio higher than 0.5, I'm going to get very mad, very upset. Uh, I'm sure you will not do that. Let's explore the other the case uh, equal to zero. We, we said that equal to zero is not going to expand to the sides. But what about a negative value? What, do, what would the negative value mean? It would mean that as you push in one direction, it contracts in the perpendicular direction. And rocks are not like that, but there are some other weird materials that actually do that. Like for example, cork, it does that. Try, try to, I don't know a cork here, but if you push a cork uh, in one direction, you will see sometimes it tends to shrink in the perpendicular direction. And that's kind of useful for when you open a bottle of wine, right? Because you kind of like compress it, and it, with it, comp it compresses instead of expanding, it gets a little bit uh, shorter in the, along the diameter, and that allows you to take the, the cork out of the bottle. And there are some other materials, uh, structural materials, that people designed it to be like that. But for rocks, that's not going to be the case. Always going to be between 0 and 0 0.5, and we're going to see that that's going to be uh, quite important in determining what is uh, horizontal stress. Okay, so remember these, these two are, are definitions, okay? That's how we define these two parameters. Next week in the lab, uh, you're going to actually run experiments in order to measure the Jan modules. Also, ratio will be more complicated to, to measure, but hopefully we'll get that set up in the lab uh, soon. So in the lab, what you're going to do is you're going to get a cylindrical rock sample to which you're going to apply stress with the low frame Make sure that you measure the diameter of your sample so you can determine the area A. Um, you're going to measure what is the change of length. Make sure also you determine what is the initial length. These change of lengths are going to be so small 
that you're not going to be able to see them, okay? So in order to measure those changes of length, we have a, an instrument which is called an LVDT, it's a linear variable uh, displacement transducer, and uh, that one is going to, to measure displacement. But you're not going to be able to see very small strengths. And by combining those two, you're going to be able to make a plot in which, this is usually how this one is done, you plot here F divided by A, and you plot here delta L divided by initial length, and you will get something like this. Very likely at the beginning, it's going to be something like that, then it's going to get steeper, and at some point, that linearity is going to be lost, and it's going to go into a peak stress, and this one is going to go down. Very close. Uh, before we talk about the peak stress, let's talk about the linearity region. In this linearity region, the uh, slope of that line is going to be E, the Yau modulus. I didn't say that, right, before. This one E, uh, we call it Yam's modulus, and as I said before, uh, this uh, Greek letter nu, this is the, the how do you say that, Mr. Boss? You know French. How do you pronounce it? Poisson. The Poisson, right? Poisson direction. So the Poisson direction. And whatever you, you want to gonna say. So, your modules. Uh, Poisson's uh, ratio. Okay, so from here you're going to get the Yau modulus. You, you may wonder, oh, what, what, what is going on uh, in this region? Uh, bless you. In many, many cases, you have this initial part where the rock uh, looks softer, but that's due to end effects. Uh, with end effects, uh, I mean that sometimes. Be, be very careful in the lab. Make sure that your rock has parallel end faces. If it doesn't have parallel end faces, look something like this. You're going to be loading your rock on these points, and that's that's not going to, to be good, okay? Because you're going to be putting much more stress in this part of the rock than in the entire rock. So it's going to look softer. It's going to appear to look softer. It's not really softer. Okay. Uh, some other times you may have some small cracks that you can't see. Uh, so that is partly captured by this initial softer region, but then it should pick up into a nice uh, uh, linear trend where you can measure the Yam module. So make sure, again, I say that your rock has the faces that look very positive, okay? All right, um, so I have a, a, a short exercise for, for you. Let's say that I want, I want to come, I want you to compute the Yam modulus right now of, of this, of my toy, piece of rubber, okay? And, Let's say that the area is about one centimeter square. Let's say that the force I apply is about 20 pounds force, which is more or less equal to 10 kilograms force, which is more or less equal to 100 newton. And let's say that the change of length divided the original length it was 10%. So you remember, right? So I think it's reasonable to, to think that I changed it to about 10% with 10 cubes. I'd like to know what is the EM modulus of that piece of rubber. And first one gets the answer, gets some. Uh, let, let's do first three. First three, I get the answer. Thousand one. 
Now for one unit, okay? Closer, not both, I'm sorry. Closer. So look, here we have a table with young modules of different materials. Uh, let's go to our material here. Rubber, small strain, 0, 0, 001 and 0 0.1 gigapascals. Okay? So how much is 0, 0, 001 gigapascals? 10 MPa, right? But we just calculate 10 MPa. Just for comparison, let's look at, before you measure in the lab, what is the young modules of rock? So let's say sandstone. Is it somewhere there? Sandstone? All right. Uh, let's try with level rock. Let's not rock. Well, let's go to quartz. EQ. Granite. Granite. 52 gigapascals. Right, remember that, that that one is gigapascal there on the top. So, so this black rubber was uh, 0, 0, 001 gigapascals. Granite is 52. And you, the rocks that you're going to measure in the lab, you'll see that are in the order of 1 to 10. Gigapascal. It's not not as steep as granite, but uh, much steeper than, than this piece of rubber that I have before with, with my fingers. Uh, okay, good. So we know what Yam modulus is. We know what pass-on ratio is. There's one more thing that you're going to do in the lab. You're going to measure what the strength of the rock is and. So far, we, we are not going to be able to explain what that is, what is the strength of the rock. But we'll do in a couple of weeks. This maximum value over here is called peak stress. If you have a sample, as you're going to do in the lab, which is unconfined, which means that there are no stresses on the sides, Notice this is not the case in subsurface, because in the subsurface you always have more stuff on the sides. But if in the lab you do it unconfined and you measure the peak stress, that value is going to be called the unconfined compression strength, or also just UCS. Unconfined compression strength. There is always a confusion about stress, strength. They, they kind of sound the same, right? But it's not the same. Okay, one thing is stress. For example, this is peak stress, but it, these are also stresses all over here. 
the big stress is is strength, okay? The strength of the material, and that's going to be the maximum stress that the material can can take. Um, okay, good. So we know it's Poisson ratio, but we know it's Jan modules. I told you that we go in three dimensions. We kind of did a little bit, but not, not that much. Now we're going to get into three dimensions, and we're going to generalize what we already knew, uh, Jan modules and uh, Cook's law. In order to do that generalization, though, uh, we need to uh, have some convention about how we call stress. Let's imagine a, an element of rock at a certain depth with a cube. That cube is within a right-handed coordinate system where let's say this is one, this is two, this is three. Let me check if it's right-handed or not. I like to do this all the time. So, one, two, three, going down, right. If it's right-handed. And uh, for simplicity, uh, let me delete the lines that we can't see. Because this is going to be an opaque solid. Here we're going to find the explanation of why we call the stress that we said before sigma 3 3. Okay. By convention, uh, the normal stress in this direction, as we saw before, we're going to call it sigma 3 3. But let's see why. This is the convention, okay? That sigma 3 3 means, and if I want to generalize that with i and j, the first number means on which phase that stress is applied. The second number tells you in which direction the stress goes. So sigma 3, 3 will mean uh, stress applied from phase number 3 in direction number 3. So why phase number 3? Well, this one is phase number 3. This one over here. Why? Because it's, it is perpendicular to direction number 3. And likewise, this is going to be phase number 2, and this is going to be phase, phase number 1 and phase number 2. So what's going to be the name of this stress that I'm drawing right now? It's going to be sigma 2, 2. Um, and this one, perpendicular to that phase, is going to be sigma 1, 1. 